Okay, good afternoon everyone and thank you very much for coming. I know we've finished off the term now, but we had one last event that we wanted to give you guys. Um, so today we're lucky enough to be joined by Daniel Handler. Um, <laughs> now Daniel is a multi-talented and successful writer, musician. Um, he's best known for his children's series, a series of unfortunate events um, and all the wrong questions, uh, which he's published under the pseudonym Lemony Snicket. Um, Daniel, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, a pleasure to be here. Now, Daniel, I'm sorry. You seem but, nice. <laughs> but I just have to open by asking, why Lemony Snicket and where did the name come from? Uh, the name came from panic. <laughs> um, I was researching uh, my first novel that I have published under my own name, uh, which is called The Basic Eight, which is the story of a girl in high school uh, who uh, has a crush on a boy who does not return her affection, so she bludgeons him to death with a croquet mallet. It's a, a comedy. And I was, uh, uh, the term I guess would be researching the novel, um, and part of the research was that uh, because in the novel, in the ensuing scandal, uh, there are many uh, terrible uh, commentators who have all sorts of narratives that they put on this murder, as uh, happens in the landscape. And so I was calling various organizations that I thought were dumb um, uh, to receive their materials so I could mock them in my novel. <laughs> and I was on the phone uh, with um, a woman who worked uh, for the dumb organization, and I said, uh, would you please send me your materials? And she said, certainly we'd be happy to. What is your name? And I thought, in a panic, I shouldn't say my name, because uh, then, they'll, then they'll have it. <laughs> uh, and so I just said to, I thought to myself, just say something that isn't your name, say another name. And I said, Lemony Snicket. <laughs> and there was a pause. And during the pause, I thought, out of all the names you could have said, <laughs> You said one that doesn't even, doesn't sound like anything. Um, and, and I thought, surely she's not so dumb. Surely the organization is not that dumb. You would think. And she said, is that spelled how it sounds? <laughs> and I said, yes. And then I asked her to read it back to me because I had no idea how it sounded like it was spelled. <laughs> the rest and, is history. Uh, well, sort of. I mean, it became a name that I used um, I liked to, uh, we were just talking about, uh, or not actually you, pretend that you're someone else for a minute. Okay. I was just talking to someone else uh, <laughs> about uh, like a name that you might give at Starbucks so that they call it out loud and you have a good time. So Lemony Snicket was that name that I used. And then some friends uh, gave me some business cards. They had some business cards made that said Lemony Snicket on them. This was many, many years ago before I had ever thought anything would come professionally from this name. And I would give those business cards out at uh, bars and things. Um, the business card said rhetoric, which I thought was a nice, easy thing to say that I did for a living. Um, I, I heard the phrase yacht lawyer. I had heard someone utter the phrase yacht lawyer. And so I sometimes would say that I was a yacht lawyer. Um, <laughs> And I didn't know what a yacht lawyer was. I still don't. But I, I said that I spoke for the interest of the yacht. If there was a, if there was a, uh, you know, a controversy between people, a disagreement, that I spoke for the yacht rather than anybody else. Um, and so when I thought it would be interesting to publish books under uh, the name of the person who was telling the story rather than the name of the person who was uh, writing it down, I had a name uh, lying around. And I used it. And... and now I'm far from home in an old building uh, talking about it. It's permanently bewildering to me. Hello. So, Would Daniel, you like some? We'll please, just assume that it's please. water. <laughs> well, I hope it's water too. That, yeah. would, be, that would be good. Um, if it's gin, it's warm. So. Well, that could also be good. Yeah. Um, so, Daniel, you started your career with a debut novel, um, The Basic It. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that book I think it's almost impossible not to start your career with a I debut. I think so too. I think so too. <laughs> but that was a book that was rejected, I think, 37 times. Yes, it was. Before Thanks for bringing that up. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> over and over again. <laughs> so what did you learn from that experience? And what was it oh. that gave you the determination to keep going? Oh, dear. <laughs> uh, 
I'm just dwelling in that unhappiness for a moment. Um, what did I learn from it? Um, that, uh, you know, rejection is hard, but I guess I already knew that. It wasn't like the first time I'd been rejected from anything. Um, I mean, I think there were certain, I think like anyone who's young and trying to be a writer and doesn't really have any experience in the world of writing, you have certain literary fantasies that, um, for Americans anyway, often look like this, uh, a distinguished room in which you'll be. Um, and uh, uh, my assumption was, well, uh, obviously I am brilliant, a publisher will recognize that right away, and instead they were writing um, things, uh, not only rejections, but clearly they had not read the book so that was a, a despairing time, for sure. What did I learn? Uh, be nice to your friends, so they'll be nice to you back. Um, and in terms of determination, it wasn't really determination, it was more like compulsion. I really enjoy writing. I wanted to have a relationship with literature. I knew whatever, wherever I ended up, that literature would be a huge part of it. And um, I, I, I had other, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, jobs, but I, kept writing because I, I liked it and I didn't, uh, I didn't really stop. And I'm a little loath to take on the mantle of that it was determination. I think there's always an assumption of causation in such stories. They were determined, so it worked out, but you can be determined and then it doesn't work out. And um, so I, 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 I kept at it because I love literature and I like writing things down on paper. I enjoy that a lot. And a lot of the, the work that you've produced is sort of targeted at, at children and young adults. What was it that specifically drew you to that audience and made you want to produce content for them? And the verb targeted always feels dangerous. Uh, but, I, well, it was mostly, it was a little bit of happenstance. Um, as we've already discussed, I was a failure for a while and I could not sell this novel that was set in a high school. And in kind of desperation, I had acquired a literary agent, and she was, she was the one in desperation, that was a misplaced modifier. And uh, she was so desperate that she was sending it to uh, publishing houses that were publishing books for young people. Um, and which at the time, the, a novel set in high school could not be published for young people. My how times have changed. Um, but, uh, and some editors said, we can't possibly publish this, but if you ever wanted to write something that was not just about young people, but for young people, we might take a look at that. And I had been working on a mock Gothic novel uh, about a, a young man uh, and who, is, who um, was married off to a mysterious count and living in a castle. Um, and because I was trying to be a kind of take on a Gothic novel uh, and I um, and, the, and you know, in a, in a typical Gothic novel, she's, it's almost invariably a woman. She's whisked away to a remote location uh, and is is married or otherwise inconvenienced and trapped. Um, I was trying to write this in the modern era, and in the modern era, although plenty of people are trapped, it's more difficult to be trapped in exactly that way. You just think, just call a cab and get out of there. And so I was having trouble with the with the entrapment of the novel, and when some editor said, uh, you, maybe if you would think about writing something for children, I thought, oh, what if children were trapped in a house with a terrible count? They can't leave, they're children. Uh, and so that seemed like the thing to do right away, a small group of children, siblings who could talk to each other. Uh, and, um, and so before I knew it, I was writing for children, and I think actually my uh, that, that indirect approach, I think, helped me write for children in such a way. It hadn't occurred to me to teach children anything or that children needed a sort of book that was going to guide them to a better life, other things that uh, guide a lot of really terrible children's literature. So I, got, I skipped those by uh, not knowing what I was doing. So a lot of the sort of plots that you come up with are quite, as we've heard, elaborate, complex, where do you get your inspiration from? And do you plan everything out from the beginning or do you just sort of take it as it comes? Uh, I do both. I wander around the world um, carrying a notebook and I write things down in what I'm reading and um, what I'm seeing and hearing. Um, and slowly these plots come forth. Um, I do think of them ahead of time. 
I outline, but I always think of when I see, when I say the word outline, what I think of to myself is in a, like a crime television show where they've written an outline around the corpse. And it's, uh, it's an outline, but it's not the whole story. Uh, and so I've written some outline where I think I think things are going to go, but I try to leave myself enough room to uh, surprise myself or to go in a different direction if it seems tedious. Um, but I, I enjoy melodrama. But, uh, I like a, a book in which uh, terrible things are happening. That's my idea of a good time. <laughs> and you say about terrible things happening um, yeah. in your, your literature. Well... Your books seem to oftentimes focus around these really sort of dark themes that are often glossed over in most modern children's literature. What is it that made you want to sort of include these themes um, in your own work? Um, I just think they're interesting. And I think when I was a child, that was the sort of literature that I liked. Um, it's the sort of literature generally that endures. Um, the number of happy books that have lasted are very few compared to the number of miserable books that have lasted. Um, when you read some of the oldest scraps of literature that you can find, that's usually terrible things happening, right? But Beowulf isn't like a super happy plot. No. Um, old Japanese ghost stories are, make Beowulf seem comparatively happy. So really old literature tends to be terrible, I mean about terrible things happening. And um, that is always interesting to me. Um, uh, uh, I'm grateful for this invitation, and I am the, uh, there was a, a room uh, reserved for me, and the room has a, instead of windows, small doors that open, and then the bottom half of the, do of the door is covered in plastic, uh, so you can't fall out. At first I thought, it's so you can't jump out, but if you were really determined, you could step over the plastic and then jump out. So it's so you can't fall out. So then it's funny to arrive in a room like that and look at the lawn below where you might otherwise fall. That's interesting to me. It's an interesting story. The part where I'm pleased to be here is less interesting than what if I'd fallen out? <laughs> yes. I mean, this nice gentleman picked me up at the train station. He took me to this room and then he said, we don't have a lot of time, so uh, I'll wait down here and you'll come back down. And I said, great. And then I thought, what if... He was waiting, and then he, he looked out the glass and just saw me <laughs> fall. What a terrible day. That would not have been a good yeah, day. Yeah, for both of us. <laughs> Luckily, there was a piece of plastic, so it was, everything was fine. It all worked out fine. <laughs> well, it, it's good that it all worked out fine and that you could be with us here this evening. I quite agree. Thank you. <laughs> so a lot of the time you're sort of drawing on your own life experiences in your work and sort of putting your own creative spin on it rather than making up everything completely from Yes, scratch. Or, or what is there to be frightened of, right? Terrible people, that's something to be frightened of. Reptiles, they're frightening. A house burning down, that's frightening. Running a bunch of laps in gymnasium class, that's frightening. <laughs> uh, uh, sledding, that's frightening. So things that occurred to me that were frightening. I grew up in California, so sledding was always frightening to me. It was like, what you did in terrible weather, why? Uh, and then I read Ethan Fromm, which is a classic American novel in which <coughs> death via sled, spoiler alert. Um, and so, uh, so th yeah, things that, that terrified me, and particularly when I was a child, I tried to remember. I remember when I learned that there was such a thing as an elevator shaft, I hadn't really thought about it before. And, uh, and uh, someone said to me, oh, I know a guy, and the doors opened, and he wasn't looking, and so he stepped into the elevator, and the elevator wasn't there, and he fell down the elevator shaft. And I, and I, I thought about I'm still thinking about that for years. <laughs> so, <laughs> where do we move on from there? <laughs> yeah, it's hard. Uh, <laughs> we can <laughs> continue to speak about elevator shafts if you'd like. We have a lot of creative ideas, so just feel free to jump in whenever, whenever one okay, comes well, to you. Okay, I kind of <laughs> thought I was, but yes, thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, so your books also deal quite a lot with sort of the value of reading. Like the books themselves will often bring it up as a theme. Do you think that that's something that's missing in modern literature and, and in the modern world more generally, that we've sort of lost the value of reading and a lot of children 
no longer do I mean, I don't know if we've lost it. I like it a lot. I'm an enthusiast of reading, and so uh, I can't imagine I'm uh, alone in this room with an enthusiasm for reading and for literature. Um, and so we know how lovely it is. And um, I, so I, I try to speak up for it. And I like books that are kind of bookish. I like books that don't feel like they could have been a television show. Oops. Um, <laughs> but um, so I find this interesting because, of course, some of your were. own work has yeah. been adapted. And how, yeah. do you, how do you feel about that? I don't know how freely you're, uh, you're able to speak about that process. <laughs> <laughs> I'm able to speak freely, but I, but I don't. I mean, I, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, I find it interesting to try to do it yeah. because I'm not sure that it's uh, actually possible. But I'm, I like the space of reading. That's interesting to me. And I like that part of the space of reading, I think particularly for young people, is that they would like to see a dramatization of it. And that's interesting to me, and so it's interesting to do it. But I like bookishness most of all, and I like to think that how I feel about literature in the abstract is kind of literalized in the Snicket books. I feel that literature has saved my life and saves lives, and that when you read literature that you're being encoded with something that is kind of secret that will help you, even though ultimately there's no help and everything is going terribly. And that is what happens in a series of unfortunate events. But it is more literal, right? The, the Baudelaire's reach a lock in which they uh, are supposed to, the only way to unlock it is to type in the theme of Anna Karenina. Well, I don't think there is such a lock, but I feel that reading has unlocked things for me, and I like the idea of a melodramatic story that literalizes that relationship with literature. That's interesting to me. I think that's what melodrama does. Yeah. Right, it's why we like to read things where people are murdering each other, is not because we're murdering each other, but because we think, what if I did, or what if it happened to me, or, gosh, I don't like that person, I'm not going to stab them, but I want to think about stabbing them a little bit. So now we're all thinking of a person. <laughs> I wonder how, if there's this, I wonder how, if there's the same person that people were thinking about stabbing at the same time, like a murder in the Orient Express of thought. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so you've involved yourself in, in many different creative processes. You've produced, you know, books, um, theater projects that you're working on, yeah. film adaptations. Yeah. You're also a musician. Sort of. <laughs> How do you think all of these different creative processes that you participate in sort of interconnect with each other? And do they sort of assist each other in any way? Um, oh, I hope so. Is there anything so. that you've sort of drawn <clears throat> out of one that has... Um, sort of given you new ideas and new perspectives um, for another? Well, for instance, I started out as a poet, as I think most writers do. The first thing you write probably when you're small is a poem. And um, I, uh, I kept writing them, um, you, you know, in your kind of romantic youth where poetry can also work as a method of seduction, you hope. Um, and I was interested in poetry, and I think that was good when I moved... <laughs> to writing prose that I was used to thinking about how tiny little things are made, because it made me pay attention to the sentences and how that goes. And for me, that's a very cl clear path. I think there are other paths that are less clear. But I like collaboration because I like being near people who are good at what they're doing. That, I think that's always um, educational, to be near people who are working hard at something. So I'm not really much of a musician. <coughs> Most of the music that I do is very close to this songwriter, Stephen Merritt, who is the leader of the band The Magnetic Fields. And he is a fantastic songwriter and can play virtually any instrument and basically produces, records, and mixes his own recordings, almost all of them. And so to be near someone who is doing that and watch that happen is marvelous and miraculous. And I feel it must be good for me. I don't it's at least good for me that I'm having a good time. So, but I think it must be good for, it must help me writing in some way, even if I can't trace it the way I could trace it with poetry. So 
do you see yourself then working more in theater and in music going forward, something that's more collaborative, you can work with <coughs> others, sort of get well, inspired Well, something happened. Uh, I don't know um, if you follow the news, but there was a pandemic. Um, and the pandemic was very hard on, much harder on other kinds of artists than it was on writers for the most part. Um, and so a bunch of very vague ideas I had for collaboration came to fruition in the past couple of years because musicians went from saying, oh, I don't know, maybe sometime when we both have time and we're in the same town, maybe we'll do something, to I'm going out of my mind, I would like to meet once a week on FaceTime and figure out this thing. So I've been doing a lot of collaborating in the past couple of years because of that. Um, so I don't know, but it's, I mean, it's, all of it is interesting to me to do. But um, I like being alone with paper and pen probably the best. Yeah. So even my collaborations, I t that tends to be what it's about for me. We meet and then I go. It's parallel play, as that we say in America at least. Then you go home and you do your thing. And given that you sort of express yourself across so many different forms of media, do you, have, do you ever find yourself with an idea that you think, oh, I could express that in, in lots of different ways? And, and how do you decide of which form of expression you're going to use, whether it's going to turn into, say, a theater production or <clears throat> a book or? Um, I mean, it's hard to say. I just try to follow it where it goes and it, and it tells me a little bit. It's a very irritatingly vague answer, I know. Um, I wrote my first play. Um, uh, my uh, father had died and in the interim weeks, of course, I was very upset. I don't know why, I said weeks longer than that. And, uh, but, but during that very raw time, I missed writing. I was very upset, and I couldn't really write, but I missed it. And so after a while, I just said, you're just gonna write a tiny little bit at the beginning of the day, and uh, it turned into a play. But at the time, I didn't know what it was. At the time, I was just, why don't you write a few sentences and see what that seems like, and then we'll do that every day, and then the rest of the day, for people who have been grieving of one thing or another, you know, it's a terrible strain on the attention span and you can't really do anything and you kind of wander. And so to make myself do a tiny little thing and then say, no, you don't have to do anything all day long uh, was um, turned into a play, for instance. So things turn into other things sometimes. <laughs> what a vague and unsatisfying answer. <laughs> things turn into other things sometimes. I don't know. You write things down, then you figure it out. What would be your advice to anyone in the audience today who's considering uh, a career in the creative, um, in the creative arts, um, or indeed to anyone who's considering a completely different career? <laughs> <laughs> well, it really would depend on the career. Would you recommend a right. career in the, in the creative space? Would I recommend a career? <laughs> I mean, I, I, um, it's for people who are considering that career, you have my sympathy, it's hard. Um, Every part of it is hard. Um, the part where you're starting out and you, you're, you usually have uh, exquisite taste, but you can't make it, so you know deep in your heart you're doing badly at the thing because you know what you like best and you know you're nowhere as good as the thing you like best. And that's very painful and uh, you don't get much sympathy uh, because um, it sounds self-pitying to go around saying it. Right? If you meet a friend for lunch and you say, I was trying to make something that's not as good as my favorite thing, they're not going to say, well, that sounds like a terrible problem, worse than anything we can think of. Let's all focus on you for a bit. So you don't get a lot of sympathy. And then there's the kind of business of trying to, to do it uh, for a living, which is almost impossible. Right? I'm at an extremely irresponsible advertisement for a career in the arts. Because it never, it, I've been struck by lightning commercially and financially. That doesn't happen to any artists, really. And so that part's really hard, too. Um, but the, when, I was, uh, when I was in college, I was taking, I had a very good mentor uh, for writing, Kit Reed, um, who uh, isn't with us now, but I like to mention. She's a wonderful writer. Uh, and when I was just finishing, when I was in my last uh, term, I said to her, I would like you to tell me if I'm good enough to do this? And she said, that's not the question. You have to go figure out if you like doing it. And I was so mad at her. I thought, why doesn't she just tell me my entire future? Why is that too much to ask of your college mentor? Uh, and it is. Um, and of course, she was right, because the delight 
in working in the arts is working in the arts. That's the delight of it. And if you are not feeling that delight, then uh, regularly, you can't feel it every moment, but if you're not feeling it regularly, then it's uh, not for you, and that's wonderful news, because you can go do something else that will probably make you less miserable. But the delight of doing it is the only delight that there is, really. So I'll open up to audience questions in just a moment because I feel like we've got quite an enthusiastic audience this afternoon. But <laughs> just before we do that... Um, I love the British definition of enthusiastic. It's like, <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure they'll be more enthusiastic right, once like we get to It's like a few laughs. That's <laughs> how we can tell that they're wildly enthusiastic. Well, it's more enthusiastic <clears throat> than, we, than we get for some people. <laughs> Uh-oh. Now that's uh, all I want. I want the hot gossip, <laughs> the Cambridge Union gossip. Um, I feel like I want to have a bit of a fun question just to finish up with these. Okay. And you're such a creative person that I feel like we could get quite an interesting answer to this. Um, oh, no. So we'll see how we go. Now it's going to be dull. <laughs> if you could host a fantasy dinner party, now I know that this is an incredibly, incredibly overused question. If you could host a fantasy dinner party, anyone living, <laughs> anyone dead, or anyone, even a fictional character, oh. who would you invite and why? Oh, I don't know. I, I this, <laughs> Honestly, this hypothetical question, particularly when it says living or dead, all I can picture is the astonishment that the dead person would have. <laughs> right? So, like, Shostakovich comes back to life, and he's like, oh, my God! What am I doing here? Which, of course, he says in a language I don't speak. So there's that trouble, too. <laughs> and then I explain to him, you're coming to dinner. <laughs> Right, like I want you to meet Toni Morrison. I, th I think that will be so wonderful. You're both artists I admire so much. One of the three of us have dinner. And Toni Morrison, who sadly more recently passed away, it's not, I guess it's more sadly because it's more recent. Anyway, she's, she would also be astonished. And then I think they would get angry at me. They would think, so there's the power to bring people back from the dead, but I'm only back for dinner? <laughs> With you? <laughs> Not with my loved ones or the artists I most admire. Yeah, so I think it would be terrible. So I have a lot of dinner parties, actually, where I invite friends of mine, some of whom are artists, and we, uh, you know, we uh, eat things and drink things and we have a lovely time. And so I'm a firm believer in the dinner party. Uh, I find that in, uh, in college it becomes, it's anti-instinctual to have a dinner party, but you should have one. Um, and you should invite who you want. But in terms of, I mean, I did manage to mention to artist I admire, Toni Morrison, a wonderful uh, novelist, and Dmitry Sostakovich, a great composer, but all I can think of is the literal aspect of it, and then particularly that Toni Morrison and I both speak the same language and Dmitry Sostakovich doesn't, so then he would just be out of it. He would just be drinking in the corner, <laughs> thinking, I can't believe I've come back from the dead. <laughs> So maybe, yeah, then I can invite Nabokov because at least they could speak Russian together. Yeah. I don't know, it's hard. The list yeah. gets longer, and then the party gets less fun. Suddenly you have it's 40 true. people, and then I'm just making soup and dishing it up <laughs> and not really having as good a time as I would otherwise. Um, so I think... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Brilliant answer. Thank Let's you. Let's open it up to the audience. Um, any questions <laughs> out Who there? Who would you have? Amazing. We'll just get a microphone to you. So, oh, yes, yeah, so we have a microphone. Amazing stuff. That's Hi. Um, I just want to say, your writing style is very unique for children's Thank books. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, and that it's very, like, dry and witty and kind of mean. Um, and obviously, like, in a series of unfortunate events, everything that kind of goes wrong in these children's lives is mainly because adults fail them time and time again. Yeah. Um, and did you think that those two things, like the reality of the world as well as the reality of how people speak to you, were really important lessons to put in children's books? <coughs> Considering how much like children's literature is quite nice and happy and mollycoddling, and that everything that goes bad is because of evil monsters. I don't think it's a lesson, because I think you know that when you're a child. Right? I mean, there are very dramatic ways in which adults fail children that we can enumerate. But just your life as a child, no matter how uh, privileged and comfortable it is, adults are letting you down all the time. I mean, you're born crying. It's already a disappointment. <laughs> then you die and you're brought back to life to go to a dinner party. 
I got distracted. Um, and so I think that wickedness in children's literature comes from children recognizing it. They already know that it's there. And, um, and I think particularly in a permeable world, even if you're not suffering, you know what suffering is, right? There's a war on, it's everywhere now. There's probably, there are very few children uh, in England who are unaware of it, even if they are personally unaffected. And of course, there's, that's not to imply that children in England are unaffected by strife in and of themselves. So I don't think it's a lesson. I think it's, I think it's the reason why those things are there is in literature that lasts, is because we're thinking about them all the time. It's hard to take our mind off it. There's suffering. How do, why can't we, why can't we get that right? Why can't we fix that? It's a very heartbreaking question. And children understand it, you know, when they're young. And when you are, are responsible for children, when you're talking to children, you have a deep urge to try to tell them that it's all right. I understand that urge a lot. Um, not just from fatherhood, but from children around me. When they hear a noise in the middle of the night, you, want, you have an urge to tell them it's nothing, even when it isn't nothing. Um, and I think that that's why that's in literature. Hello. Um, so, kind of like most people here probably, um, Series of Unfortunate Events was one of my favorites uh, as a kid, but kind of revisiting it in the last few years, um, something I found was one of my favorite themes was kind of how it explored like VFD and the kind of morality of that. And I feel like that being something that isn't as obvious to kids. Oh, it was, but like just things like the schism or like such kind of adult things and how it kind of changes towards the end of the series. And I just wondered how it was kind of um, as the series kind of progressed, um, exploring those themes and going from almost like the episodic um, kind of books to exploring those kind of things. Um. I think, it, I think it was the inevitable byproduct of writing so many books about the same things a little bit. Um, in some ways, I think of it as one novel because that's how it felt in my head. I, was, I kept on exploring it. And, uh, and, you know, terrible things happening are painful. Um, in, uh, you know, P.G. Wodehouse's Jeeves books, nothing painful is happening. It's delightful, but nothing re really, really grim and terrible is happening. And so they can be kind of the same thing over and over again, uh, which is not a criticism. Um, I think to start to think about, well, these children have seen a whole lot of murder, when, where can that go that doesn't turn them into ghouls who are saying, ho-hum, another murder? And so it goes into this kind of history of previous violence and secrecy that they only have glimpses at and trying to um, figure out what the equation is about exploring the past and living your own life as it happens, I think, for, as in the journey from childhood to adulthood, you, you are suddenly an adult, then suddenly you're the person who's supposed to be making the world better. It wasn't supposed to be made better for you. You're supposed to be doing it, and it's alarming. So I think, um, you know, I think unless I was going to tell the story of kind of three psychopaths and how they became psychopaths, uh, which maybe it is, uh, I think you would have to go into this kind of allegorical weight about where such terrible things come from. Um, hello. Um, yeah, a series of fortunate events are my favorite books as well when I was younger. And um, I was just thinking there's like, there's so many characters and they're also kind of like um, vibrant and full and, and, and different. And I was wondering if you ever like took inspiration from people you knew into your characters and um, also if you have like a favorite character that you wrote. <coughs> um, did I take inspiration from people I knew? Yes, of course. I mean, I always think, how could you not? No, I've never met a person before, so I just made these people up. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I like, I like thinking about people. Um, and um, some people recognize, who I know recognize themselves in the books, but far more people that I know recognize themselves in the books than people that I've actually put there. So I like that too. Um, and do I have a favorite character? I don't know. I kind of move around thinking about them. I tend to like the minor characters. I, it, I, I like to think of somebody who's just doing 
one little thing. Um, so various tiny little characters tend to be my favorites, I think. One of the most interesting elements of the books for me is the sort of annoying, precocious child that I was, with the puzzles and mysteries that you incorporated it. Were those a particular fascination of yours? And do you think they're what make the books so engaging for certain children this way? You know, because it challenges them to work things out themselves. I think when I was a child, those sort of things felt smart to me. Um, the, 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 they're the stuff of smarts. I wasn't particularly good at puzzles like that, uh, but the people who were felt smarter than I was. I'm married to someone who, for instance, is good at them now, and I'm not good at them at all. Um, so it feels like the stuff of smarts um, rather than some abstract wisdom. Which, which would be really insufferable, I think, if the Baudelaire said, oh, well, all pain is cyclical or something. That would, <laughs> you'd think, no, 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 no. But when they know something, and I think also when you're young, there's certain facts that are interesting to you, and the fantasy that those would come in handy. I mean, it's probably the, on, it's the ongoing fantasy of education. It's what all of you fantasize. You're interested in something, and the fantasy is that what you're interested in is in some way vital. It probably isn't. <laughs> but maybe you'll be able to build a life in which it feels that it is. That's very essential. Well, it's probably a really illegal and really boring question. Um, but what were your thoughts on having your books turned into sort of the film and TV adaptations? Was it what you expected? Was it strange? How did the two sort of differ? I mean, it was all sorts of things. I worked on... I wrote uh, nine drafts of the screenplay of the Lemony Snicket movie, and then I was fired. Um, so as you can imagine, that was a, what we uh, call from a distance an emotional roller coaster, as if it were <laughs> some fun thing that you would want to go on, rather than what it really is. It's just terrible. And um, my involvement with the Netflix show was, uh, was similar. I was also fired, but... Um, <laughs> But I ran a writer's room in my dining room for a while, and um, writer's rooms for television are um, often very complicated and very volatile, and they are, um, I think, at the heart of certain kinds of lack of representation in television, is that the process of making them is actually built around certain cultural assumptions in which all kinds of uh, behavior is rewarded that is um, uh, accordingly most exhibited by the people who made the system. Um, and so uh, it was, for instance, a particular delight to me to try to make a writer's room that had different rules in it and had different people more welcome and was a more uh, diverse writer's room than along all sorts of axes than might otherwise have been. And so that's an example where that's a big delight to me. I don't know how much of a delight it is in terms of how, the way that manifested itself on the screen. Is I don't think too many people say, I can feel watching this episode that the room was more comfortable. <laughs> um, but, that, but I take pride in that kind of thing. And so, and then, I mean, television and film is kind of endless collaboration. Even the fantasy that, oh, there's some director who has control over everything. You can't possibly have control over everything. There's too many things. And so it's fun to go down to the costume department and have the costume people say, we have made so many boring shows about lawyers where all we do is we go to the Banana Republic and we buy a bunch of sweaters until we see what sweater goes on a lawyer. And so, and now we get to make these things. So that's exciting to me too, just to, to I, it's not really providing for them, but, but that there's an opportunity for them through these books that they get to do that. So that kind of thing is really delightful. And then, um, I mean, people like it. People, I mean, I was waiting upstairs today to go into this room, and someone said, oh, I saw the movie when I was young, and I really liked it. And that's nice to hear. Families write me a lot, or I hear from families that they're all watching the TV show together during um, heavy quarantine for people to say, oh, Wednesday was our night, and we watched something is really, that's really fun and nice. So, uh, but there are parts that are terrible too. I mean, it's very expensive to make film and television. And so if you're an executive in charge of making such a thing, it really is as if someone has handed you a bag full of money and told you to watch it for a while and you would be scared <laughs> all the time. And 
I tried to say, like, it's not your money. And that didn't always go that well. Um, and so that's dealing with frightened people who are in charge of it is terrible. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's all so many, many things, I guess is how I felt. Would you say that although it ended with you getting fired, it was overall a positive experience and you're <laughs> glad you took part in it? Yeah, because I, I, I mean, I, I, I'm a person who I have more solace in the moments of happiness that it has brought me. And also the solace, the solace lasts longer because um, the executives don't, I don't run into the executives who say, boy, are we glad that we fired you? <laughs> but I still hear from people who say that they like the show. Yeah. So it kind of evens out in that way. But some experiences were very terrible for sure. Um, yes, that was a very enthusiastic hand just in the middle. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sometimes you choose the person who was first, and sometimes you choose the person who is most enthusiastic. Be enthusiastic. It's an everyone. interesting set of <laughs> metrics that you're using. Hi. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask you about Count Olaf and how you conceptualized his ending, like how he kind of went from a character who was a kind of caricature of himself to someone who was capable of genuine love and heartbreak and, you know, um, kind of... <coughs> A, 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 a kind of heartbrokenness as opposed to his like kind of fake nightmarish love with Esme and having this like tender moment with the children like before dying. How, how did you arrive like after all the books of him being this kind of like comical villain that he is someone who you can kind of almost sympathize with? Like how did you, how did you conceptualize that ending for him? I mean, I think when you look at anyone, you can almost sympathize with them. And I think it's one of the heartbreaks of the world that it's actually very difficult to hate a person that you've spent time with and looked at for a long time. Um, it might be easier in some ways if someone who's done terrible things never seemed sympathetic to you. Um, so I think that's where it came from. And it's a little bit the same as what I was talking about before. It's to have a villain who's doing the same thing over and over again, that villain would begin to get weary and lost and to learn that at one time they didn't need to be villainous, maybe, or they had an opportunity to be something else, but that it went broken. I don't know, it's hard. I'm not good at, at villainizing people in real life. I find people sympathetic. We've still got plenty of time, so uh, <laughs> we can get as many of these in as we possibly can. Now, I have no other plans for the evening, this actually. This the first time, I think. Hi. Um, Hi. I've kind of read some of your writing on Guy Madden's uh, kind of cinema, mm. um, and I know that uh, he was kind of in talks to perhaps direct some of the adaptations at some point of, or at least the film will kind of be involved somehow. I was just wondering if you saw any kind of, or, or what it was in his work that you kind of saw as um, perhaps in correspondence with your own or in dialogue with your own. Yeah. Um, so Guy Madden is a filmmaker I admire very much, uh, and he for people who don't know his work, it, uh, he's made a couple of silent movies, but all of his movies look like silent movies. They are very stagey. They look old in some way, though they're often, there'll be something incongruous, so you'll know it was filmed recently. And they have extremely melodramatic plots. Um, I think my favorite of his films is called Careful. Uh, it's the story uh, of... Um, a, a small village so high up in the Alps that anyone who speaks over a whisper causes an avalanche. Um, and so it's a repressed society, as you might imagine, uh, and it doesn't last, the repression, I mean. Um, and um, I, I don't think he was ever considered seriously by various corporate entities to direct anything because he makes very strange films. Um, uh, I have put myself up for consideration for him that I would like to work with him. So about once, I, I got to meet him once and I snagged his email address and once a year I say, wouldn't it be wonderful to work together? And he says, I mean, maybe. <laughs> um, but, I, but I like his work a lot. I like the shape of it. I like that it's very strange. I like that um, it is kind of inherently ridiculous, but then very moving in places. And then, I mean, this is sort of a collaboration, but he made uh, an autobiographical film called My Winnipeg 
uh, which he narrates. And he was going to narrate it live in a showing uh, in San Francisco where I live. And he uh, emailed me and he said, I'll be narrating my film and you should come and then maybe we'll have a drink afterwards. And I said, oh, that sounds great. And then a few hours later he emailed me and he said, well, my flight has been canceled and so I told them that you would be willing to narrate it instead of me, which I felt I couldn't say no to because I just said I was free for the evening. And so I couldn't say, oh, uh, I'm also, you know, stuck under an elephant or something. And so I went and did it and just to, to pretend I was him a little bit and because... Uh, his films are so mysterious, and he's a little mysterious. People assume some sort of joke was going on. Nobody could believe that what had really happened was that it was on impossible that he was here. They thought some kind of trick was happening, uh, which was fun. Thank you for bringing him up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm conscious that I'm sort of facing this way, so I'm taking quite a few oh, questions. Oh, now we're going here. geography, so gonna, now geography. I'm gonna, <laughs> so I'm gonna spin around and take a question just from um, further back there. Um, yep, to the guy in the, in the middle. Hi, uh, thank you for coming. What is your favorite book? What is my favorite book? Oh, I mean, you know, it's, all the answers would be fake. But um, I, I mean, this, this time, let's say Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf, that's a really good one. Um, I like uh, how, I mean, I think it's maybe a theme of what we're talking about a little bit, of strangeness and accessibility. Uh, Mrs. Dalloway is a very experimental book, but as soon as I say that, it sounds boring or tough to read, and I don't think it's either of those things. I think you can read it very easily and digest it. And I think that, I mean, you heard it here first, Virginia Woolf is a really good author, and um, I think her ability to um, depict consciousness and the way that you're thinking of something, but you're kind of thinking of something else, uh, is magical. But then as soon as I said that, I said, oh, well, Toni Morrison's jazz does that really well, too, in an interesting way. So then I'm starting a, a lecture about various things that I think about books. But I'll just stop it. Mrs. Dalloway, fine, that's the best book. <laughs> There's no possible other answer. It's not a matter of taste. It's easy to see. You just evaluate it and decide. Mrs. Dalloway is best. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I should be more specific. Or everyone just sort of worn microphones. No. Um, it's a pleasure to be in your presence, Mr. Thank you. Mr. Snicket. It's sweet um, you to have me. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so is there any reason why in the novels that the time period is kind of left quite ambiguous? Is there a reason behind that? Or have you actually got a time frame in mind you just didn't feel the need to mention it? Um, I think the books take place in a setting that is of a child's imagination. It's how you kind of think the world is shaped a little when you're young, maybe. And so, you know, that's why you can have, there's a lovely house with a lovely woman who lives here, and then over here, someone, there's someone terrible who lives in a terrible house, because that's kind of your geography, maybe, of your neighborhood when you were growing up. You think that's terrible over here, and it's wonderful here. And then you maybe revisit it, and it's all terrible. Um, that's only my experience. Uh, so, so similarly, I think, you know, the time when computers weren't helpful and you rode around on horseback uh, is, a, is not a time, historians can't really pinpoint that as well, but I think when you're young, you kind of, everything makes sense, you know what that means. Um, I remember that uh, when The Bad Beginning was being edited, there was someone at the publishing house who said, don't you want to check when the walkie-talkie was invented? And I thought, no, I don't want to check when the walkie-talkie was invented. <laughs> Who cares when the walkie-talkie was invented? I, it's not like I'm claiming I invented inventors? it. Yeah, <laughs> well, right, presumably. I believe his name was Mr. Talkie. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm, that, that's not interesting uh, to me. And sometimes uh, I've been invited to speak at various historical societies uh, about a time period. Uh, they'll say, your books portray... Uh, like Chicago in the 1920s, one of them said, so will you come speak to the Chicago Historical Society? And I've had to write back and say, what? they don't take place in Chicago in the 1920s. What are you talking about? Hi, thanks very much for coming. Um, back when I was in primary school, we did an exercise where we had to write a biography of a famous person, and you were the person that I picked because I couldn't think of anyone else, oh, and I was quite uh, familiar with the books. You <laughs> flatter me, I think. <laughs> so this is quite a surreal moment. Um, so my question is, how often do you go back and read your own writing after it's been published? And if so, 
can you really enjoy it, or do you end up being analytic of your own writing style at the time? Oh, I hardly ever do. Um, I will only do it really if I have to prepare for something. Um, uh, and I, I mean, it looks like going through old, it feels like going through old photographs of yourself when you were an adolescent or something. It's a, yeah, it's a terrible feeling. I want to change all of it all of the time, <laughs> and it's too late. And I have to do a self-hypnosis of, like, it was the best you could do at the time. Um, <laughs> but no, I don't like going through it. And in fact, the most painful part probably of uh, doing the Netflix adaptation was that I had to go back and read all of a series of unfortunate events. And I, uh, I, I to cheer myself up, I went uh, to read a couple of volumes at uh, like a bar. And uh, I was asked if I was okay <laughs> by the staff, because apparently I, I looked so terrible I thought I was in mourning or something. I mean, when someone at a bar asks if you're okay, you are not okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think I'll come back round to this side. Um, yep, at the very far side. Have we got a mic? Uh, David, you can just nip over. Thanks. <laughs> Other, yeah, now I see. Hi. Um, I had a question about all the wrong questions. Um, Wonderful. I was wondering, when you wrote the plot, did you write it backwards? Because there's so many mysteries like hidden in it. Yeah, well, so in that A Series of Unfortunate Events was me thinking about gothic novels. All the wrong questions was me thinking about noir. And noir is a tighter mystery in a gothic novel. You know, if you read a Wilkie Collins novel, it will have a plot twist that comes from nowhere and goes to a whole other place, and you know that Wilkie Collins had no idea that what he was doing uh, next. And if you read a good detective novel anyway, they know where it is. So I didn't write it, I mean, I didn't write it backwards, but I planned it all out very carefully. Uh, and, um, and, I, and I held back the volumes for absolutely as long as possible. My publisher was uh, quite, quite impatient with me, uh, but they got over it. <laughs> um, you've spoken a bit about the difficulty of succeeding in the publishing industry and how you, as you said, you were struck by lightning. Um, do you have any advice for someone who's written a novel and is looking for a literary agent or looking to publish? <coughs> I mean, I have more sympathy. Um, it's very hard, and in addition, um, I, I know enough about British publishing and American publishing to know those are entirely different animals. So not really, I guess, is the, the thing. But, um, I, I mean, you... I think again, you have to you have to take the pleasure from writing it, and and if and it isn't like you. No one can hypnotize themselves to say I don't care if it's published, but you, but you have to retain the pleasure that you're having from dealing with it because that's what you will cling to, in the shipwreck of dealing in publishing. You will cling to the small piece of wood that is the pleasure that you had in writing it. But you have uh, sympathy for me, and. Um, I, but I will say that uh, today I received news that this uh, writer that I, I had read, this writer I knew was, had, I didn't know him personally, but he had written a couple of tiny little chapbook things that I really enjoyed, and I wrote him and I said, hey, I like these. And uh, he wrote back and he said, could you help me get this thing published? And he sent me a thing and I thought, oh no, no one's gonna wanna publish this. I thought it was brilliant, but I no one thought I was gonna publish it and it's gonna be published. So um, the moral of the story is sometimes something happens you knew that anyway, though. It's another thing that's not a lesson. <laughs> um, if there are any more questions, yes, just over here. Is this the last question? So this has to kind Maybe. of gather up all of the <laughs> threads of everything that we're doing and making a sweater. Uh, one of my favorite things about your books are the number of literary references you have in it. Uh, were those sort of planned out that you put them in, or were they sort of off the cuff? Um, <coughs> Um, they would occur to me. Also, um, yeah, they would occur to me, and but also planned out. I don't really... Uh, it's hard to say the difference in the case of a literary thing. Sometimes I would say, oh, it's time for a literary reference. What would be good? And sometimes I would say, I've been waiting my whole life to make a W.G. Seabald reference. Here is my day. Um, and also I think it's because it's one of the first objections that I had when The Bad Beginning was published 
Soon there were more sizable objections, but my first one was that someone said, I can't believe that uh, children are going to be expected to read the word Baudelaire, and then they might read the poetry of Baudelaire. You know, they had a whole, they had the fantasy of so many uh, alarmists of literature. You know, before you know it, they'll be reading the French symbolist poets themselves. <laughs> Um, because that's, of course, what all great murderers have done, is immerse themselves in literature and translation. Um, so, as, and as soon as I said that, I thought, oh, I have to do that way more. Yeah, so it, was, it had the opposite effect, the attempt to s discourage me. Well, I think on that... Oh, no, there's, on, here this we is, go. This is too this enthusiastic. Is the let's, um, this is the one that's going to sum up everything. Yeah. yeah. We don't have to have discouragement at the end of the evening. Yeah, sorry, I thought we, if you thought we were done. Um, where did the inspiration behind Sonny's character come from? Well, when I was starting to write a series of unfortunate events, I was, uh, uh, I didn't have any babies in my life. I didn't know any babies socially. Um, <laughs> I didn't have friends who were having babies yet, or I didn't, you know, and there was no, uh, there are many things you can go and research, but you can't really, you can't like make a date with a baby. <laughs> you can't call a baby and say, can I pick your brain? I'm trying to write a book. And so, but I began to think about what, I have a younger sister, and I began to think about what I thought of her when she was a baby, which was that, when one of the things I thought was, why, does, why is everyone confused about what Rebecca wants? I know what she wants because I was the older sibling. I could speak her language, and I knew what she wanted. And I was often could not believe how dumb people were about what it was that she wanted. Um, and so uh, I, I've, I tried to look at, the, at that kind of prism of the world, of feeling like a child and, and thinking about babies. Um, and I think that, for me, literature for young people has that spirit running through it. And it's the opposite spirit of, I'm an adult and I have something to show you. I think it is, um, there's something that is, there, is, there is a lesson in childhood that all of us could find, and that um, we know this, because it haunts us all the time. We think about our own childhoods all the time. And I think that to try to continue to be haunted by that is a wonderful way to go, on, go through the world. Well, I think that is, um a lovely point on which to, which to finish. Thank you so much to all of you for coming to what has been an excellent last event of the term. <laughs> um, I know term sort of has already finished, but I'm really glad that you all made the effort to come out this evening. And I think we will be in the bar for a little bit after this, so please do come and say hello. Um, and I hope that you do all choose to come along again next term. The team have been hard at work putting together an, an excellent series of events. So I hope you enjoy that. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.